Pleased to be joined now by number 55 from the Winnipeg Jets. He is Mark Shifley. And first of all, Mark, thanks so much for joining us tonight. And second of all, do you have more questions about that painting behind you or Elliot's beard? I don't know if I've uh, done a Zoom call here. So you guys are the first, uh, first people to ask about it. So um, <laughs> kudos. You guys have a good eye. What do you think about Elliot's beard? You know, it's pretty good. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wasn't expecting it. Uh, you know, it looks like he's been out in the wilderness, but, uh, you know, uh, it suits him for sure. Who on I the gotta team? tell you, I would grow, I would grow a beard like that if I went out to the wilderness, Mark, because I'm not sure I'd find myself back properly. I'm not the most <laughs> outdoorsy of human beings, unfortunately. Who, who, Mark, on your team can rival that beard? I think it'll make the whole interview about Elliot. No. Uh, who on your team could rival that beard? Um, you know, uh, Josh morrissey has got a pretty good beard going lately. Um, you know, he he shaved it at one point and then he grew it back again. So. Um, you know, when his beard gets going, he looks like he's a, a wilderness man for sure. I gotta say, I'm surprised at that answer because Josh is pretty young looking. Like, I figured, like, maybe a more grizzled, like, I figured Blake Wheeler could grow a heck of a beard. I figured one of your more grizzled team, Line A, could grow a heck of a beard. I figured <laughs> one of the more grizzled guys would get that vote. It's impressive. I would, Morrissey would have been low on my list. I wouldn't have guessed. Yeah. That. If you see a picture of him, it's, uh, it's definitely a good beard for sure. Uh, give us a snapshot of your life right now. I know we're into phase two, but what's the last three months been like for you? Uh, you know, just trying to stay busy. Um, you know, trying to get workouts in when I can, you know, trying to just trying to just stay as active as I can, you know, sitting, uh, you know, just sitting at home and, and not doing much doesn't sit well with me. So just a matter of, you know, you know, getting some fresh air in my lungs, you know, being busy. Um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of been the gist of it. I'm a, I'm a guy that likes to do a lot. So, um, you know, a lot of working out, a lot of outdoor time, um, you know, hikes and stuff like that. So you're know, just trying to stay as busy as I can. What kind of, I'm curious, a creative workouts. I know you're a guy, as you said, who doesn't like to sit around and do nothing. So what are maybe some of the more interesting things that you've been able to do to either keep yourself in shape or just keep yourself going? Um, you know, <laughs> you know, I try to just kind of, um, you know, kind of try to play games with myself, you know, if, you know, you know, bouncing a bouncing a ball on a stick. Um, I have to do a certain amount of times. If I don't do it, I have to do an extra set. Um, mm -hmm. You know, trying to land a, trying to land a ball in a, in a pot or something like that. If I don't do it, I have to do, I do it five times, however many I miss. That's how many sets I do, or that's how many reps I do. I, I've been trying to, um, you know, do things where I, I start to get tired. So, you know, the mental capacity starts to go and then I have to do a, do a challenge that, um, you know, might task your, you know, cognitive ability. Um, so, you know, I try to try to play little games with myself. It's just kind of, you know, it's stupid little stuff, but it, it keeps things interesting. It keeps things, you know, I, I have, I have to, I have to put something on the line. I love competition. So, um, you know, that, that kind of drives my competition side. You know, I have to tell you, like, first of all, I don't think that's stupid at all because I think stuff like that is great. And I remember when we were in university, we used to play a game on our balcony where we had a can, like it was an old like tomato sauce can. And the first person to bat, you had to bounce it in off the back of the balcony into the can five times. And the loser, the winner got to throw it off the balcony and the loser had to go get it. Like, so I'm big into stuff like that. Like, and I know people are gonna say that sounds crazy. And I know you gotta look on your face like people are gonna think <laughs> this is so stupid. I think stuff like that is awesome, particularly in downtime. I think it's fantastic. Oh, for sure. I think, uh, you know, me and my brother, we were probably the most inventive game makers in the world when we were kids. Like all we needed was a tennis ball and, you know, both our pairs of shoes and we could make a net anywhere. If it was throwing it or kicking a ball or whatever it was, we, if we were in the ocean, if we were in the lake, if we were, whatever we were doing, mm. we could find a way to, to make a competition out of, out of something. So um, I definitely have that. Uh, when it comes to sports, I have a creative side. When it comes to anything else, my creative side is, isn't great. Mm. <laughs> You've been able to find uh, ice at all during all this, or are you like a Mars blade guy? Like, what are you, what are you doing for, uh, for skating? Yeah, early on, I, I, I got a pair of rollerblades. So I was, you know, I was able to, you know, do a lot of rollerblading. Um, you know, which helped a lot, just doing a, doing a skating motion. And then, uh, you know, then rinks started to open up. So, you know, I've been able to get on the ice, uh, you know, a number of times. So, you know, I know it's, it's crazy. You know, I, I know talking to a lot of my buddies around the league, you know, this is the longest, 
um, you know, anyone's been off the ice. I know for me, I, I'm a guy that, you know, the season ends and I want to be on the ice in a week. Um, so, you know, to be off the ice for, you know, close to two months was, uh, you know, it was pretty insane for me, but, you know, getting on the ice was, um, you know, pretty good feeling, you know, just, you know, feeling that cold, that cold air, uh, in your lungs, to be able to shoot a puck, being able to, you know, feel the ice again was, you know, such a, such an amazing feeling. You know, I kind of wondered about that for you, Mark, because you love hockey and not only playing it, but everything that comes with it. And I have to tell you, like, I know if, if under normal circumstances right now, we'd be around game seven of the Stanley Cup final. And it's one of my favorite times of the year. I can imagine how itchy I feel not being able to broadcast at this point in time. A guy who plays it and loves everything around it like you do, it must be making you crazy at times. Oh, for sure. There's definitely days where, um, you know, I definitely have to rein it in a little bit, you know, if I'm playing a game or, you know, I can just, I'll, I'll just snap, <laughs> um, you know, and I, and I know exactly, I know exactly why I'm doing it. I'm just, I just get, you know, I get, I get ramped up. I miss hockey. I, I you know, a big thing I miss is, you know, you miss being around the guys, you miss being around, you know, a lot of your best friends that you spend every single day with. Um, you know, I know I've been away from Andrew Kopp for now, uh, you know, close to three months now and you know we spend every single day together mm. um so you know you, you miss you miss the you know that interaction you miss your best friends um you know and then for me I love competition you know any of my buddies know I hate to lose and I love I love just you know whatever it's for if it's, if it's playing for you know a buck if it's playing for just bragging rights whatever it is I love competition <laughs> so you know I think that's something that I've really missed is you know getting into competition feeling that um, that side of things and, you know, letting, letting your adrenaline take over and, and, and deal with that. You know, you've talked a lot about Jack Eichel um, and for good reason. And one of the, the, the key points that I, I thought you've, you've pointed out about him is that he brings it every single shift. And we've talked a lot on this program, the podcast about consistency and you know, consistency leading to greatness. And you talk about that with Jack Eichel. I want to get your thoughts on, on one thing that Jack Eichel told me recently in a Zoom call um, for Team North America from the World Cup. So he was on the call, like Aaron Ekblad's on the call as well, a few other guys. And about halfway, you would love this, about halfway through the conversation, he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are we talking about Team North America? We didn't do anything. And I'm like, it became like the coolest cult team of all time. You have John Cooper saying it's the most talented team he's ever been part of. You look at, at that time, the future of the NHL, it's all in that dressing room. And here's Jack Eichel with the big perspective, the bird's eye view. Why are you going on about this team? We didn't do anything. What are your thoughts on Team North America? You know, it's so funny. You start, you start talking about that group and that team. Like, it gives me the chills a little bit because, you know, it was, um, you know, it was one of the funnest teams, most fun team I've ever played on. Um, you know, I, I got lucky. That I got to play with Connor McDavid and, and Austin Matthews. So I'm like, you know, I, I had to pinch myself and, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I can't believe that was true. But, you know, it was, it was some of the most fun hockey I've ever played. It was so skilled. It was so, you know, you know fast paced. You know, we, it, it was – you know, there wasn't a whole lot of structure to our game, but it, it kind of, you know, brought us back to, you know, being, you know, kind of being back in our junior days, being back as a kid, you know, just kind of playing the game of hockey and, you know, doing it as a team and doing it all together. It was, it was a really, really, it, it's something that you can't really explain, but I know all the guys definitely feel that same way. Um, it was just such a, it was a, such a special group. And I agree with Jack. We, we, we didn't do anything. We, you know, obviously we <laughs> wish we would have went on and played, played, uh, you know, Canada in the semis, but, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that would have made it, that would have been the, you know, icing on the cake, but it was, it was such a special group, such a great group of guys, such a fun group of guys. You know, it, it does give me the chills to, you know, think back on that team. I, I'm sure you've thought about this and I think Elliot and I disagree on it, but I've always been curious what that crowd in Toronto would have done with that game, whether it would be cheering for team Canada or cheering for team North America, because that team North America captured the imagination of hockey fans. Unlike any team we've seen since, I don't know, pick it. It was completely unique and everybody got into it. Oh, it, it, the was, fans it was amazing. Would, have done? What would, the, would they have cheered Canada or you guys? Be honest. I think you guys. Uh, you know what? I think, I think it would have been pretty split actually. I think there, I think there would have been a good chunk of Canadian fans just because, you know, it's in Canada, you know, there's a bunch, there's, a, there's some Americans on our team, obviously. 
Um, but I think I think there would have been a lot of can, that Canadian fans that would have switched to Team North America because I think we were kind of mm-hmm. like the, the sweethearts of the tournament. Yeah. Um, you know, we were we were young and we just wanted to. We were just playing fun hockey. We were playing fast hockey. We were playing skilled hockey. And I think, um, you know, I think I, as a hockey as me as a hockey player, I wish I wish hockey was more like that all the time. Um, you know, sometimes it gets a little a little too structured, but um, you know, it was such a it was it was such fun hockey. I, I, but I think it probably would have been a split crap. I'll tell you this: if that game would have been close, more people would have gone to your side. That's I agree with you. I think at the beginning it would have been split, but say it goes to overtime or it's close in the third period. Uh, now here's the bigger question mark. Yeah. Head to head, Team North America versus Canada. Who wins? <sighs> you know what? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a tough one. You know, I, I'm going to say our team, I think our team, you know, we would have just gone out and just went guns a blazing. We got nothing to lose. Um, you know, Canada had so many amazing players though. Like that line of Crosby, Bergeron and Marchand was, was, you know, pretty much un- unstoppable. So, you know, I think that, you know, they both, all three of those players, all, a lot of, uh, pretty much every guy in that team had been through so much in terms of, you know, Stanley Cup finals, Stanley Cup playoffs, Olympics, all that. I think at yeah, first maybe they'd have maybe a little tentative, and then they would kind of take over. So it would be interesting to see how that game would 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 play out and 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 go from there. What was it? John Cooper told me some game you guys would play after practice? It was you and a couple of other guys, Connor Hellebuck. It wasn't too tough. What what was it? What was that the little game you guys used to play after practice? You'd stay for like an extra fifteen minutes. Cooper said he would stay and try to and try to watch it. A you game. know what he's talking about? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was Tupac or if it was Rebound. Because um, I know Helly, sometimes in the, in the, in the practices, didn't get too many shots. So he would, he would stay after. But I know I, the, the thing I actually remember the most was me and Austin would stay on the, on the ice for like, I never met someone that wanted to stay on the ice as long as I did. Because mm. <laughs> usually after a practice, everyone, you know, every, and especially at those practices, you know, usually you have some, you have meetings up right up until before. It's not like a regular, like I know our team, I get on early opposed to staying on late, mm-hmm. but, um, but there you kind of get on right at the you practice started at one, you'd get on, you know, right at one. And then, you know, afterwards, and then I, I was usually a guy shooting around, kind of just working on some little things. And then, you know, Austin, after the first practice, we just started passing around and shooting and working on a few little things. And I never met a guy that wanted to be on the ice as long as I did. I think, I think, I, I think that was something that was so, you know, I, I gained a lot of respect for, for Austin right away. You know, obviously he was a young guy and he just worked hard and gave it his all every day and, you know, got, and you saw he got better and better as the tournament went on. 13th forward. Yeah, Austin Matthews it didn't last too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't. Go ahead, Breach. So, you know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your group this year, Mark. And I, I there's some teams, you know, when the pause came, um, you know, first of all, I wanted to ask you that night, I, I was working in the studio that game in game against Edmonton. And I have no recollection of what happened in the game because it came pretty clear um, that, you know, things were ch- about to change. And that the NBA player Rudy Gobert tested positive, and the NBA announced the middle of your game it was suspending the season. And I, I just wanted to ask you that you're in a great game against Edmonton, two really good teams, and you must have had some idea that was what was kind of starting to happen. Like, how did it unfold that night for you guys? Well, the first period went went normal, um, but then we came into the room, and you know we had a lot of guys, you know, our, our healthy scratches or injured guys that. You know, they were in like the dry stall area and, you know, a few guys went to the washroom and, you know, they're like, Hey, like NBA just got canceled. And we had, we, we all had thoughts that there were, there was a possibility of it. I don't think any of us knew it was actually going to happen, but I think we were like, you know, there, we have to prepare ourselves. It could happen. Um, so then when we heard the NBA was canceled, we were kind of like, well, we have to be next. Like there's, you know, there's no chance we continue on with the NBA being, being uh, suspended. So then we come out for the second period and guys are kind of a little, some guys knew, some guys didn't. Then you get to the, you get to the opening face off and uh, Connor and Leon were on the other side of the uh, other side of the face off circle. And, and Leon looks over to wheels and says, Hey, do you hear about the NBA? 
So there was almost like a little bit of talk, like, like, <laughs> like, like, and then, and then and I know in my mind, I was like, this is real. Like, like there's a chance that this, that this season gets suspended. Like this is, it's kind of a surreal feeling. You don't, you have no idea what, what is going on and you have two more periods in a hockey game. Like mm-hmm. we didn't really mm-hmm. know what to, what to really think of it. And um, it was definitely, it, it was a, it was a, it was an experience that I've never, I've never experienced for sure. And I got to think like you guys were really starting to go. You had that big win against Arizona a couple nights earlier. And you know, the thing I think the most impressive about the Jets this year, Mark, is you guys had every excuse to fall apart. Like nothing happened for you guys the way it was supposed to happen. And then when the pause hit, you guys were really starting to go. And I can imagine as a team, you're sitting there going, oh, like just as we're getting some momentum here. I agree. We, we, you know, our team was coming together. Our, you know, we picked up DeMello at the deadline. It was a great pickup for us. Um, you know, a right-handed D-man that can play with, that can play with Morrissey. Um, you know, that was, that was huge for us. Helly was obviously amazing all year. And, mm-hmm. you know, that never, that never changed. Um, but then our forward group started to come. You know, we had Eakin playing with, uh, with Patty and, and Nikki, and that line started to go. And then we got – we have Copper and Lowry on our, on our third line who play amazing together. Copper's game was, was only going up and up and up. Um, and, you know, I was, I was back with, with KC and Wheels, and we loved playing with each other. And our, our, our team just started to kind of – we just kept on rolling and rolling and rolling from the deadline. We, 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 we felt that as a team, we, everyone seemed to be getting better. Our team started to mold a little more. We had some, um, you know, up and down the lineup, we felt way more solid. And, you know, I think everyone obviously questioned our defense um, all year, but I think everyone saw how amazing Neil P- Pionk was this year. Um, yep. You know, amazing on our first PP unit, you know, did everything for us. And then obviously when you have, when you have Josh Morrissey, you know, playing against the team's best and he, you know, he was injured for a bit. Um, but our D just started to come together. DeMello came in, fixed it. We had guys healthy again. Our five, six was solid. We, I, I think as a team, we just felt like we were in such a great spot and people wrote us off all season long, but we felt like we were just, we were just hitting our stride. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Cop and uh, and Lowry there a second ago. We had someone tweet in. I I don't have it in uh, in front of me right now, but I'll paraphrase. And it was something to the effect of, "Mark, what's it like coming on the ice after Lowry and Cop have the other team pinned against the boards, have them hemmed in for thirty to forty seconds, and then you jump on the ice and get to feast on them? What's <laughs> that feeling like?" It's amazing. <laughs> uh, it, you know, you know, when all of a sudden, you know. Laos was usually the centerman, so he would be changing for me. And he, you know, he's a he's a nice guy, so he he comes off in the ozone. Um, sometimes <laughs> I'm not that nice, um, but uh, you know, when all of a sudden, and and that's the thing is like, like obviously Copper's my roommate. I love playing with Copper. So if all of a sudden I get on for a few shifts, and it was funny actually. Um, we, me and Copper actually always wondered this stat. It was two years ago. Our our points per shift together or like, or second together was so high. Cause like the amount of times that I would come on or I'd stay late and he came on, which a lot of the time I would be the one staying late. Cause and I know Paul Maurice wouldn't like hear me, me hearing me say that, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it, it, you know, I, those guys, those guys do so, such great work. Um, you know, they, 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 hem, they, they play such good D first and foremost, but then, you know, if they're able to play against the top line and give us a second line matchup, it, it helps us so much. And then all of a sudden we get a, we get a, a tired first unit and we get to come on and, and roll around the ozone. It's, it's amazing. It's the best feeling in the world, but um, I wish I could return that favor to, to, to Laos, Laos and Copper once in a while, but I, I sometimes I get a little selfish. <laughs> first of all, Maurice won't remember in another month when you come back, Mark. He's not going to have any recollection <laughs> that you said that. I, you know, I'm listening to that. I, I'm curious, you know, are there stats you look at? I've always wondered, like, you know, what do players look at? Are there stats of yours that you look at just to say, am I doing something right or wrong? You know what? I'm, I, I think, I think for, for that one I was talking about with Copper, I think that was when we always wondered if they could figure out from two years ago, if they could see, like, get the actual second by second and, like, the amount of times that we, like, we connected for a goal. 
when we actually were on the same line. We always mm-hmm. wondered that. But I, I'd say in terms of stats, like, you know, I'm not a big uh, – I'm not a big analytical guy. I don't look at advanced stats at all, to be honest. Um, you know, I think obviously, you know, you all look at goals, assists, and points. But I, I think I think goals, assists, and points are all byproducts of you know doing the right thing over and over, and mm-hmm. you know being in the right spot for your line mates. Like I think, yeah. You know, aside from Connor McDavid, who just has blinding speed and once in a while can pick up a puck and go end to end and score it doesn't happen in this league that often. You know, you look at the good, you look at the good lines, like, you know, Pasternak, Bergeron, Marshawn, they have all three guys on the same page. They know where he, they know where, you know, when Bergeron's going to be in the slot or Pasternak's going to be, you know, backside post, you know, you need all three guys in the same, in the same spot, um, you know, to be able to, to be able to produce that. And when you're doing the right things over and over from, you know, your D zone out, that's when you get the goals and assists and the points from doing the right things over and over and over. You know, dovetailing that, that's a really, I think that's a really thoughtful answer. You do all the right things and that leads to, to, to the production. Um, puck tracking technology is coming. And uh, there's a few things that I'm curious about, the little, little theories that you want either proved or, or disproved. One is I think puck tracking technology is going to show us uh, who are the really good passers and who aren't. And I also think that it's going to finally prove that you don't have to have a hard shot to be a good goal scorer. When puck tracking technology comes in and we start to break this down and learn more about the game because of it, what will be most interesting to you? You know, I agree with that one, Jeff. You know, the shot, the shot speed is going to be, you know, one, um, you know, a, a guy that comes to mind is, is, is Patty Kane. Um, you know, the guy doesn't, doesn't rip the cover off the ball. He, yep. you know, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's a pretty simple shot every time, but he knows how to place it every time. He knows how to, how to, how to, you know, be, you know, very, um, you know, sneaky with his release and understand and, you know, trick goalies that way. I think, I think that's going to be a cool one. I think, I think another cool one in terms of, um, you know, if, if there's, if there's players, player tracking is seeing how far a player travels in a, in a game. You know, I think about a guy, I think about a guy like Jack Eichel or Connor McDavid, those guys must travel. Like if you, if you're able to get the distance that they were, that they skated in a game, you know, you think about Jack Eichel, every power play goes and picks up the puck behind his own net pretty much goes end to end, you know, Connor McDavid gets the drop pass. Every power play goes end to end. So Hmm. I think, I think that would, that would, that would be a a cool, a cool stat to see. Uh, Mark, you mentioned Andrew Kopp. You and him have both been in interesting leadership positions during this. Kopp is the player rep uh, for the Jets and you were part of the return to play committee. And just what did you learn? Um, it's a unique position for you. You were in the middle of all those negotiations about the playoffs and COP was in the middle of the voting. What did you guys learn about that side of the game, the more business piece side? I learned a ton. You know, I think, I think this was a big uh, eye-opening experience for me in terms of, you know, understanding, um, you know, how the NHLPA and NHL works. I think, you know, for any young guy coming into the league, I was the same way. You know, I didn't educate myself on what was going on with that stuff, what was going on with the business side of things, what's going on with, you know, the, the, you know, the rules committee, all that stuff. I just wasn't educated on it. And I, and I, I'm mad at myself now that I, that I didn't, you know, take more initiative when I was, when I was younger and in my, in my first few years to, you know, understand what's going on with the cap, understand what's going on with the growth of the game, understanding what's going on with, with the rule changes. And, and, you know, I was obviously very lucky to be chosen for the committee. And, you know, I think, you know, Copper's way better than me at the business side of things. I'm not a great math guy. Copper's amazing at that stuff, but me and Copper do bounce ideas off each other a lot. I know when I, when I had, when I, when I had, when I had a thought, I'd be like, Hey, do you think this is a good idea to bring to the committee or, and, you know, I think that's, you know, I'm lucky to have such a great friend like that, such a smart friend. And, um, you know, one that I can, I can, I can share my opinion. And if he says, Hey, Chuck, that's so stupid. I, I know, I know that he's not saying, I know, I know he's not saying that because he's, because he, he doesn't like me. I know he's, he's saying that because he's just saying his opinion. And I think that's, you know, that one, one thing just makes a, a good friend. You want a guy to just be honest with you, but I I've learned more in the past two months about the, about the NHL and the NHLPA than I've learned in the first six years of my career. And I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful I had that opportunity and I was so happy that I was able to, you know, input different ideas and, um, it was such a, it was such a cool experience to actually, you know, to be a part of it. Tell me one thing that happened that you look back and say, 
I cannot believe this was a suggestion for the postseason. There, uh, there were a lot of uh, like that's the cool thing about it was like there was not one stone unturned. Hmm. Like every single possibility that was out there was mentioned. Like and and there was times, yeah, like there would be there would be a a, a scenario and be like that's so complicated. Like you know there were definitely some some you know round robin uh, thoughts out there. Mm -hmm. um, but it, like every single every single thought to every single team down the line was was thought out and I, I, I commend the NHL I commend the NHLPA and our committee um, for going over every uh, every absolute detail and making sure it was you know we can make it the most fair we can make it the most competitive and you know I'm you know it was a lot it was a lot of work I was on the phone more than I've ever been on the phone before but um, <laughs> But it was it was it was a great it was a, a great committee. The NHL did a great job. Um, you know, the NHLPA did a great job at it. And it was you know, anytime anytime a guy would ask me like what's going on with it, I was like, trust me, there's no stone being unturned right now. There's been every, there's been everything <laughs> from 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 A to Z being uh, being thought out. So it was it was uh, you know it was pretty cool. You know, maybe you've given us the answer already to this next question, and that is analytics. But I think one of the reasons why people really gravitate to you, Mark, and you're a wildly popular player, um, you don't even have to be a Winnipeg Jets fan to be a Mark Shifley fan, is that you get excited about seemingly everything about hockey. Like you watch it, you live it, you're the all-in guy. Everything is game seven about hockey to Mark Shifley. I want to ask you what you find boring in hockey. Is there anything that's like, oh, this is the one thing I can't stand. Like you seem to love everything about hockey. Like that's why fans love you. But what to Mark Shifley is boring about hockey? Don't say the commentators. Yeah, our intermissions. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I would say. I would say the the one thing that I wish would change in hockey was probably defensive structure. Um, you know, to a certain degree, and this is might not just be the NHL, but I'd say this is you know what I'm seeing in you know junior and minor hockey. I think there's just too much structure in in the game. Um, you know, I wish there, I wish it was a little more freewheeling. I wish, like I was lucky, I played for Dale Howardchuck. We could do anything we wanted. Once you took it past the line, he laid the he laid the hammer down and said, "That's enough. That's not happening." Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I hear, I hear about, you know, there's, there's kids in, in Toronto that are doing video sessions at like 11 years old. And when I played minor hockey, we practiced twice a week. I, I, I was playing volleyball and basketball for high school. And, and, and uh, right before a game, I'd be going to games in, in my volleyball shoes. Um, so I, I, I wish the structure would, would start to, to, to fade out a little bit and, you know, go back to the North America team, you know, McClellan, he literally, he literally said, "Hey guys, this is our basic structure. Go out and play hockey. You know, we're we're still going to defend, but go work hard. Back check when it's your turn to back check. Four check when it's your turn to four check." And it, it, he made it so so simple, but we all knew if we crossed the line, we crossed the line. But um, and 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 then you know, obviously there's there's repercussions with that. But you know, I think when it when it's so structured that you're not even playing the game of hockey, and you're not even thinking it. Mm -hmm. I think that takes a little bit out of it because I, you know, I'm a guy that, you know, I can, I can play a game. I can think about, I can think about a shift from the Edmonton game that happened. Like I, 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 I analyze it. So I, I analyze it very quick and am able to go back into that game, you know, right after the game the next day that, and, and bring up certain plays. Hey, Hey wheels. Do you remember this time in the second period where I grabbed the puck out of this corner and you went here? Why were you thinking that? And, and, I think when it goes to like all the, all the video sessions, all the, you know, I wish it was a little more individualized opposed to structure based. I think that's, that's the one thing that I, that I, I find boring. I love video, but I love individual video. And, you know, I think sometimes the structure can go a little, a little, a little haywire. That's a great answer. Fridge, we got about five minutes left in our, in our chat. You want to finish yeah. up with a, with a riveting final question? Yeah. My, my, uh, my last question is Tom Brady, Tampa Bay. How do you feel about that? I know you're a big Tom Brady guy. I know, honestly. Like I, so me and Copper had a bet on it. We were like, like I was like, there's no chance he's leaving. Like, like, <laughs> like this, this is this is this is this is before this is pre-COVID nineteen, 
um, we had, we had arguments and arguments and arguments and all of a sudden it happens. And of course the first guy to text me is Andrew Kopp. Um, and he thought he was leaving. He was like, I think he's leaving. I think he wants to have a little more say in things. And he was right. Um, but I, I was, <laughs> I was blown away. I've been asked that question by all my buddies. Like, are you going to still be a Patriots fan? Or are you a Brady fan? So, um, so what's the answer? Back, what are you? We'll <laughs> what are you? I, I think I, I think I, I'll still. I, I was always a I was always a New England Patriots fan. I love Bill Belichick. I love what he does. Um, but I'm definitely gonna. I, I, I'm probably still gonna be a Tampa Bay fan too. Um, but I don't think my allegiance is totally gonna go away from the Patriots. That's a very thorough answer. Uh, you've been very thorough with all your answers. Uh, listen, uh, we had some tech problems, and that's why we're doing the Zoom chat. You've been very generous, uh, and you remain one of the, the big reasons why we hope the NHL gets going again sooner than later. Mark, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, best of luck. Stay healthy. Stay well. Look forward to seeing you back on the ice. Thanks, guys. You too. Thank you, Mark.